Um, so the last topic, we're going to deviate from what you've been dealing with and hearing from us all day. All day we've been talking about case law updates, things of that nature, what happens when you get into a lawsuit, how to deal with that. This presentation with myself and Neil Sweeney, um, who will be taking the second part of this, are strategies to avoid the courthouse to begin with because we pride ourselves in keeping our clients out of litigation. But if it's necessary, then we're there to help you get through it. So, um, and this presentation that I've done, this one, or different versions of it many times throughout my career, and Neil has too, um, this one uh, is, we, we have a, a different variety for project personnel, and I think it's really helpful for the project team, uh, but we tailored it a little bit more for you guys at a higher level, but uh, hopefully it comes through, and hopefully everything you hear from me and from Neil are just reaffirmations of what you already know through your own experience. So it's not too bad to hear it again, right? So with that in mind, here's the agenda, but we can skip past that. So we're going to talk about keys to managing risk. And we want to uh, first, and I think you heard this earlier today, understand the contract. We're not going to get too much into that, but I think that's sort of axiomatic. You need to understand what your contract is. Understand basic legal principles. Obviously, that's a no-brainer. That's where you guys come in as in-house attorneys for your clients. Um, identify all uh, and comply with all notice requirements. Something, again, should be doing that. And we heard, I think, uh, uh, was it Brad Sands this morning talk about Texas's notice requirements, et cetera, and then the recent Texas Supreme Court case. Um, and then, obviously, implement and use a, a, a robust project documentation system with Procore and everything else that we're seeing today. This isn't usually a problem. It's managing that data on the back end. But again, keeping on top of all this, making sure your, your data and your, your correspondence is properly handled is important. Document the job progress, not claims. I could go on for an hour just on that one bullet point. But that is important, and that's going to be a recurring theme you're going to hear from me in this next 20 minutes or so, is to document the progress of the work, not document the claims. Um, you, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that most of uh, the times people get in problems is when you have someone out in the project site thinking they're a young attorney and they're documenting claims and they're escalating rather than de-escalating the issues. So, top 10 principles of effective project documentation. This is something that, again, we blow out for the project team. We like to do that for our clients. Most, most of the times, I think it's well received. We do it gratis. If you've got a contract, call us up. Happy to spend an hour with your team working through highlighting the key risk areas and then what to do and what to focus on and what's important and how to just orient the team. Most of our clients are sophisticated enough that they have the in-house counsel, they do that themselves. That's probably what some part of what you guys do. But the key point is, again, managing the claim process is everyone's responsibility on the job site, not just the risk manager or the attorney or the project manager, it's everyone's. Effective claim management, uh, it's an integral component of everyday successful owner and for the contractor. Practical and conscious documentation is a full-time job. I, it, it goes without saying, but it is the lifeblood of the project, and it's critically important, and it pays off significant dividends uh, in the back end. Successful project requires effective utilization and implementation of claims process tools and people. Again, you've, you know this, but it's, it's just it's important to reiterate that again. Uh, if it's not documented, it never happened. So again, we beat this into all of, all of the people we work with, all of our junior associates as well, as well as our clients. This is critically important and um, it helps you avoid the process of litigation from the get-go. Just something to remember, if the claims process is something that everyone's there to handle and deal with, uh, it's usually mandated by the owner. Uh, it's something that happens on complex projects and I'm going to come back to this in a bit. This is my favorite, document feelings, or don't document the feelings, document the facts. And this is so difficult to, to do, uh, and, and it's necessarily to send the notice, it's how you send the notice that can avoid many of your disputes. And oftentimes people 
get in the, in the project uh, sign or getting so wrapped up in everything and then they can't divorce themselves necessarily from their, their feelings and their emotions and the personal issues. But it's important to document the facts. And as Neil said, the law is the most important thing and then it's the facts, the facts, the facts, and the facts. And that is what we deal our whole entire life with or in. Uh, that's, we're always going to the facts first and foremost. We generally know the concepts of the law, but finding those documents and interviewing the witnesses and your, your people, that's how you get there. But it's important that you get the documentation done properly. It's, it's agnostic, it's aesthetic, it's just documenting the facts. Evaluations and assessments need to be done with counsel. Uh, you wouldn't be, maybe you, would be, maybe you wouldn't be surprised, but there are a constant internal memorandum, et cetera, evaluations and assessments that are done at the project level that are damning and later pop up and can be used against us in a court of law uh, or an arbitration and having legal counsel involved in that process and actively managing that process is critical so that that document doesn't get out. But more importantly, the lawyers can be there to help strategize the potential outcomes um, and steer it away from going off the, the rails too far. This is critical. And I, if you take anything away from this discussion, hopefully you take this back to your team and your, your personnel, that properly documented claims are substantially more likely to be resolved amicably. It's, it's, it's not fun sending that notice to, to the other side, whether it be to the owner or the, the subcontractor, or if you're the sub to the general contractor, but it has to be done. And there are ways, I'm sure you all know, how to send that notice without being pejorative or sticking your finger in someone's eyes. But it's got to be done because if you go in there and you say, I feel like I've been harmed, I feel like I've been delayed because of your guys' uh, problems, that's not going to win the day. It's if you've got documentation in place, properly done, that substantiates the causal connections between an impact and your alleged delay, then you're in high cotton. Claims are a natural uh, byproduct of the risk allocation in all contracts. And I'm gonna skip ahead, ping off of that to the next slide, which is, I love this, claim is not a four letter word, right? Um, if you just get that, if you can beat that into your, your team's heads, that's the most important thing to come out of this. Claims are expected by the owners, claims are expected by the general contractors, claims are expected by everyone. I'm not saying they're a good thing, but changes happen, everything changes, right? And if you can just understand that, hey, look, it's okay to send a claim or at least a notice letter. You can do that to the owner up front if you have an issue without being sort of um, a, a, a kink in the process. Oftentimes, though, and I'm dealing with a new case right now, oftentimes we see disputes because everyone early on in the project is back slapping, popping champagne. Everyone's in a good collaborative mood. We just got this big project. Uh, the owner didn't you know, respond to these RFIs in time. It's okay, we can just keep moving along with our lives. Life will be okay. It's those situations where people would fail to send the notice letter of saying, hey, really needed those RFIs answered three weeks ago. Now I can't do X, Y, or Z. Had that simple letter been sent, things would be okay and it wouldn't cascade into what later turns into a multi-million dollar issue. It's important to get ahead of that and tell your people to keep on top of that and send a letter or an email and just document the facts. Again, a really well substantiated claim will help avoid litigation and or disputes. Again, everyone in the industry understands and fully expects to have a claim or a change um, but if you don't do it and you don't submit that claim and it's not properly backed up with, with documents, whether it be a TIA or daily reports that substantiate the impact, you could have just lost your claim and be in a position of negotiation where you're now weak and you're not going to be able to press the points as you should. And I think, you know, I hear it a lot of the times as well from my clients that, well, we didn't want, you know, we, we're still trying to you know, get the client on our side, we don't want to have a reputation within the industry that we're litigious, right? There's a balance, I'm sure you all on a day-to-day -day basis are dealing with that issue. How do we do this 
document the claim, but not come across looking like we're just looking to sue anyone and everyone. That's the balancing act, and I think from what I have seen, it's possible to do that, again, with the understanding that sophisticated owners and contractors understand that claim is not a four-letter word. These things happen, it's how you document it, and it's how you communicate, it's critically important. So here are some of the ramifications. If you don't do that, or if you do it improperly, you have admissions, you're providing support to the owner's claim, you're, you're providing support for your consortium member, if you're in a JV, if you don't properly document, or if you, pro if you document something with, that's feelings or emotionally based, that could be giving uh, information or uh, data to the other side They may ultimately hurt you going forward. Keep in mind, obviously, what is your, your duty to respond? Do you have an obligation to respond to a request for information? Yes, and how do you do that? And what do you say is as important as how and when you say it? So correspondence. These get people into trouble all the time, right? Confidential and internal documents are not what they appear to be. They are not confidential, as you probably know. Everything will be subject to production in, a, in an arbitration, AAA. We heard not, the international may not be as friendly to document production, but certainly in litigation and certainly in a US-based uh, AAA arbitration, those documents are gonna be discoverable, if not discovered. Simply marking confidential and personal or uh, on top of a document doesn't give you the protection. As lawyers, you, you already know that. Chris. What do you think about the phrase, lessons learned? Which is like the hey. first thing <laughs> everybody types in, like along with pejoratives, the curse words, that's the second thing. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, no, I got a slide on that next. You're good at teeing people up. Thank you, I got a slide on that. Um, so just be, yes, Mr. Murdoch. Okay, so something about you since before and I opened up, the last slide, I mean, one thing that totally conceptualized with the statement you made about how contractors frequently are very reticent to bringing forth claims because they, they don't want to upset the client. And that's very understandable. And I, I work against that a lot. And one thing that we've kind of done that, that helps that and sort of takes the edge off that before every claim, before every letter, we in fact even send over to their project manager, we call them first, we talk to them. We'll even show them the letter. And we'll, you know, we may not change the letter at all. We will say, hey, it's not changing. I want to talk to you about this letter. And so that they're not getting that letter cold and they're like, uh, and they understand where we're coming from. And sometimes you may be sending a notice just to comply with the contract saying, you know what, I don't think you have much here, but if you don't send you the notice, then we waive our claim. So we're sending you notice, we preserve our claim, and we're looking into it, that I'm sure you're probably okay. Now, I can't put all that necessarily in the claim on this letter. You can have that communication. And sort of taking that, that steam out of the claim notice letters, I think it's been pretty helpful to maintain our relationship with our client at the same time, same time preserve our rights under the agreement to the change orders. That's a, excellent advice. I think picking up the phone for just about everything is critically important and, and messaging what you're about to send yeah. in written format is perfect because that always happens, right? Texts, emails, documents get taken out of context. Putting that little personal spin on it is perfect. That's great advice. Daniel used to uh, work, <laughs> at, he used to, he used to practice law with me. He's since gotten smarter and went in house. He's now in Bechtel. And so that, that advice works, does it not? Uh, just picking up the phone and calling somebody in advance, especially if you're gonna send them a nasty gram, that little call really just alleviates a lot of the pressure. Is it gonna you know, resolve the dispute? Maybe not, but we're all big boys and girls, and again, a claim is not a four-letter word. Yeah. We're just, it's just business. It's just business, it's just the facts, and as long as you do it and you come at it in a fair, reasonable perspective, which I think everyone here would, you should have a better outcome, especially if you've documented properly. You know, one thing I'll add, sorry, add mm -hmm. that yeah, too, is, that, is that the notice will also give both opportunities, uh, our opportunity to think about how to mitigate the impact, which is also the owner would really appreciate. Like, I don't understand what you're saying this contract, but by giving me notice of this, maybe you can think of how to mitigate this impact so it's not something that you actually pay a lot for. Maybe there's alternative ways to think of this. Yeah. 
So to that mutation and making peripheral touch calm, I think. I, and I do that even in my own practice as an attorney, right? It, whenever I'm getting ready to send a, a pretty stinging motion to the other side, which is warranted, by the way, <laughs> uh, I always call the opposing counsel up because I don't want them to receive something out of the blue. And, and it's, I think it's just a professional courtesy that we all should do, or we, you should do what you want to do, but that's what I do. And I find that to meet with success. Again, it just makes the relationship which is adversarial in nature, easier to resolve down the line. That's very good. Thank you, Daniel. Um, emails, the attorney-client privilege, the work product doctrine. Uh, you know, with everything that's going on and all the documentation that we talked about, everything electronic, all the emails, et cetera, it's hard for us on the back end to weed out what is considered work product doctrine, something that was done at the direction of an in-house counsel or a claims team that arguably is covered on a work product doctrine so as a hint maybe start telling your people to if you give someone an assignment just put that in the email and slap that everywhere you can and slap it on top of the document too and the, the margins so that we can see later on when we do our, our searches using the our cool ESI that we have we can pick that up relatively easily yes yeah, talking about attorney client privilege and work product, if you're trying to keep your internal memo undiscoverable, is copying a lawyer on all of the project correspondence effective? Well, Cindy, that's a good question. Uh, uh, this, what, what will you, I mean, you tell us, what did you think? I mean, you've, you, yeah, it doesn't, no. It, no, and, and in fact, a really interesting thing, I had a couple, about 10 years now, an arbitration where um, the in-house counsel for our adversary, a pretty big equipment provider, uh, he also had a, a commercial hat. So he would be negotiating certain change orders, but then he would hide behind the idea, well, I'm an attorney, you can't look at my emails, and we said, well, guess what? And we got their privilege log and we selected about 50 different emails that we thought would be really good ones. And we put that in front of the panel in camera and we got about at least half of them because they had a different capacity. But to your point, just blanketing every single thing with attorney-client discussion or privilege, it's gonna lose its, its power and its impact. And I think you'll have a really difficult time enforcing it. It becomes sort of trite. Any other questions or comments? Bill? Um, so, back to his point earlier about that, uh, you know, giving a heads up about that claim letter, you obviously don't want that coming from your outside counsel because that just raises, that <laughs> no. raises blood pressure. But at what point do you recommend your clients give you, as outside counsel, a call and say, we've run into an issue? What do I need to do to help me guide through so that we're papering the trail just in case something happens? Ghost right. Yeah, so we're involved a lot of times. We embed into the project, but uh, so it's, it, it should be involved earlier on. A lot of our clients sitting here today are sophisticated. You have your own in-house counsel. They usually get involved early on as well. Um, one thing that we don't do, I, I try to teach people in my office not to do, is me send a letter during the course of the project from the, it made the clients like, well, can you send a letter? Because I think it will get more attention. I appreciate that coming on my letterhead, but the last thing I want to do is come across heavy-handed in a negotiation or a commercial issue. It's better to, I'll ghost write it, and I'll you know, make it look nice like a lawyer didn't write it, but it'll get the, the zingers in. And that way it looks more like it was an organic discussion that happened contemporaneously. And later on when I'm using that as an exhibit, I was like, well, when did you mean when you wrote this? Well, you know you wrote it, Chad. They don't say that, but you get my point. Yes, sorry. There's, a, there's another benefit uh, to that phone call is that when, when this process starts, the initial tendency is for everybody to shut up and only communicate in writing because people are so scared that they're, how something is going to be taken, if they're going to believe that I said something, and they're, they're reluctant to speak on the phone. And you know, doing this for a long time, that's generally how most issues get resolved, is that speaking directly to each other. So by picking up the phone early on, it sets a precedent. Like, hey, I'm going to memorialize this conversation. You're going to get an email. You're going to get something there. 
but we need to keep talking. And that, it sends that message as well. And it keeps, the, it, instead of shutting down the line of communication by just sending that letter, it keeps them more open. I agree. And, and lunches and dinners too. And, and bringing the right parties or principals to the table early on, a huge benefit to stave off a lot of these issues that ultimately escalate into something really bad. So now this, this part of the presentation is just a quick three emails that I've used and I've blanked out to keep the people protected. Uh, but when we do this and for our clients, we have 50 emails if we have to. And we, we just collect them and we get some great emails that we, things you shouldn't do. So this was, these next three emails were from um, a project I worked on, I don't know, 10, 15 years ago. And it was a, a large 20-story condominium in Florida that the parking deck collapsed during construction, unfortunately killed a couple people. And I represented the contractor. And back at the time, I think it was around 2008 or 10, the real estate condo economy collapsed in Florida. And so the owner was trying to say, oh my God, because of your problem, contractor, my, the valuation of my building went from 100 million down to, to 2 million. Thank you. Um, and it's because of the, 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 the collapse of the parking deck that you were building. And we're like, well, no wrong answer. One, we just followed the design that you gave me and we built it to, to the design. And second of all, the value of the, your condo building was collapsing anyway because the economy was collapsing. You were just using this as an excuse to blame it on us and they were seeking the delta and the, the valuation. During Discover, we found this document. And again, this is a situation where if you've been in Florida, that's probably the one state I'm not barred in, thankfully. Uh, you have to have threshold inspectors, independent threshold inspectors that go in and, and inspect everything. And they're, they're supposed to be agnostic, independent. And here we found an email where they were talking internally about, hey, you, I know we, we use um, 40, di 40 diameter uh, rods for support for rebar, I think it was at the time. And just pretend like you never saw that. This did not look good on a screen bigger than this. And I just let it sit there for about 15 minutes as I just grilled this guy on this one email. You don't want to be in a situation like that. Now, just to make this point a little bit more clear, in that same situation, because it's not just personal, your project people, lawyers can make the same mistake. In that same, same case, the lawyer for the, the, the condo owner we were trying to prove that, hey, you lost the value of your business, not because of us, but because of, of the condo collapse economy, the collapse in the condo economy in Florida. We got this. They were fighting. We, we subpoenaed the, the bank to get documents. They refused to give it to us. It was an arbitration. We finally got it like on the eve of the hearing. And we got this email from our opposing attorney sending this to the bank. And what he was saying is, look, the other side is trying to say that we were in default because the economy was collapsing and they were in default. And I know you kind of said we were in default, but I don't feel comfortable about that. If Chad calls you, can you just tell him, hey, look, we're long-term customers, everything's good, and that the customer is uh, you know, not in default of the loan. Um, we, we really want you to not say that. And then he kept going on and on and on. And we used this one at the arbitration as well, and the other side's attorney is sitting across from us. You can imagine how awkward that was. But the point is, lawyers can also fall prey to this. Just because he sent an email to a third party doesn't mean, or strike that, it meant that it was no longer discoverable. He wasn't talking to a client. There was no joint defense agreement between them and the bank, nothing. Chris, your question, lessons learned. First lessons, don't do lessons learned. Right? Just don't do it. I don't know what benefit we get out of this, but if you do do it, if you do do it, have your attorney involved. I understand why you want to learn from your past, but have the attorney involved, cloak it in attorney-client privilege, and move on with our lives, and then just burn every single copy of that document. But that's how you avoid that situation. But as long as it's part of the, the attorney-client discussion, which it usually can be and should be, you're, you're set up perfectly. Uh, Dealing with, generally speaking, some general rules. There are no special rules due unto others. Don't give ammunition to the owner. If you write a letter to your sub, if you're, 
the general contractor. As a subcontractor, if I'm representing a sub, I'm going to put the general in a two-front war. If I'm representing the owner, I'm going to put the, the general in a two-front war. Two-front war meaning the owner is taking positions against the owner. Strike that. The general contractor is taking position against the owner and against the sub that may be, thank you, that may be an opposite. And I'm going to find that through discovery and I'm going to use that. So just be careful when you're writing emails or your team are writing letters to the other side. Think about if you're the general contractor, how is this going to look if the owner finds this out? How is the sub going to look? Or how's this going to look if the sub finds that out? Now you gotta be cautious, obviously, about shielding the owners and subs from bad news. You've got to tell them we're gonna be late. But you don't make conclusory statements. You just say, here's what's happening, cite the facts, the facts, and the facts. Um, and it's uncomfortable being on the fence. It is, but that's what you guys all get paid to do, and that's the art in keeping the, the ship going, especially if you're a general contractor. So, um, really nothing special here that we haven't already talked about. Again, this falls in line with um, the two front war issue. We just, if you're the, we're gonna talk a little bit of strategy. If you're the sub, I wanna put my general in a two front war and say, you need to settle with me before you move on. And if I'm the owner, I'm putting the general in a two front war. And if you're the general, your job is to keep out of that two front war. And you do that by being just agnostic when it comes to project documentation cite the facts, the facts, and only the facts. So, um, avoid the two-front war. You should do that from the very beginning. How do you do that? I'm just confirming my notes. Yes, okay. Um, generally easier to, to align with the sub if you're the general, because you're, you can say, hey, let's point all our arrows going upstream at the owner. Uh, the owner's the one who's likely gonna be the one holding the design obligations, so you can use that. Get a liquidating agreement. If you're smart, you thought about that and you put that into your contract up front. Um, so then you don't have to deal with that issue. Otherwise, you're gonna be negotiating in a position of weakness when claims are flying all over the place. And you go to your sub and say, hey, let's get, have a liquidating agreement. Sure, how much are you gonna pay me for it? You don't wanna be in that situation if you can avoid it. And be aware of the Severn Doctrine. Um, this, is, uh, this is an interesting one, especially in the federal procurement world. If you are the prime and you submit a claim or, and you waive and release the, the owner of certain claims, that you may have also just bought in the responsibility for your subs if you didn't put that in there. So just be, be cognizant of that. As you know, in the federal government world, the subs can't sue the government and can't bring claims against the government. It has to be done through the, the name of the, own, the, uh, the prime. Uh, cooperation and joint defense agreements, get one, get it in your contract if you can. Last slide, avoid pushing the sub. I think this is critically important. Um, tolling agreements, I know, you have a, I know you have a claim, we're gonna work on it, we'll get that through. Um, if there is legal action, slow it down, tamper it down, hopefully you can get a tolling agreement, but uh, stay the litigation arbitration. Whatever you can do to focus on common goals obviously is better, and with your subcontractor, you should be able to find some commonality and that's what you should do, um, including all the way through arbitration and trial. So with that, that's my part of the discussion, and Neil is gonna get a little bit more into the philosophical perspective. Thank you. Okay, so we're ahead of schedule. Tiffany told me I could talk till at least five o'clock if I wanted to, so we're, we're doing great. <clears throat> so <clears throat> I'm gonna cover sort of the second half and it's when it's not just project documentation, but you actually have a claim or dispute. But again, as Chad said, what we're focusing on is the project level, not litigation, uh, and to get the things resolved sooner rather than later. So I start out with a concept, Stephen Covey, very warm, cozy, begin with the end in mind. And when we're talking about in the context of the project, it's not to have a kick-ass lawsuit that'll go on for two years. It is to mitigate, at least mitigate, and ideally resolve the claims and disputes real time during the course of the project before things spin out of control. That's m not always possible. Um, then I go into my more martial terminology, which I know sounds very aggressive, but if you know me and work with me, 
I, I just like using terms like this because still what I'm talking about is, I won't try the Latin expression, but if you prepare, if you want peace, prepare for war. I like the alternative thing, peace through superior firepower. And by that, I mean, if you basically go through the project and half-ass, first of all, your documentation, then your claim preparation, then your schedule analysis in a claim that's developed, and your damages, and you don't bother trying to articulate and communicate to the owner, it's, I think Chad started out with it. The more you prepare, the more likely it is you're gonna be resolved, you're gonna resolve things earlier. So that's the idea. It's not to write nasty letters. It's not to have a fantastic lawsuit. It's to get the information communicated. And, and actually that's a two-way street that I'll talk about. Whether whoever you're asserting a claim against, you wanna communicate your entitlement and the basis for it and everything else to them, you also want to hear what they have to say about your position because you don't want to find out two years into discovery or a week into trial, oh, wow, this position is not so good. I wish I had heard about this stuff early on. Um, you know, I say, and some people take this the wrong way, there's no principle involved in what we do. I mean, nobody's going to jail, nobody's getting divorced, no child custody. No horrific injury unless you do OSHA stuff, which I don't do personally. Um, it's just about money. That's, that's all in construction disputes. It's dollars and cents, and also those dollars and cents are relative to the cost of getting to the result. So you don't want to spend $400 million winning a $500 million claim unless you're assured of recovering your attorney's fees, which you can never be assured of. You want to result, get the most money you can as soon as possible and with the least expense, so you're netting out. Um, you know, it's interesting because, it's funny because you think the lawyers are the people that are jacking up people to go after claims and fight, but no. I, I would say more often for us, it's not us. It's we're trying to calm people down and tamp people down. And um, you know, sometimes executives and the project people, it's like they want vindication. No, they don't. Oh, they're, that's emotional. They really don't. They would like vindication. They mainly want money and, then they, and to move on to some more successful things. F complete a successful project, not again be embroiled in litigation for several years. And so to me, this is very important because it's something that I've witnessed all the time. It's just human nature, it's understandable, but the project team has to recognize that they are principally responsible for preparing and resolving claims, whether you're calling on proposed change orders, claims, disputes, whatever, but you know we're talking way before litigation. So they can't, they've got to understand and be trained that they don't just kick the in-house counsel and then they don't have to worry about it. Or if in-house counsel brings in outside counsel that they're like, well, I don't have to deal with that anymore. Absolutely not. Because no claim, like construction claim, is going anywhere without the facts, the facts, the facts, and the facts. And that comes from the project team. The project team far better than any lawyer could come up with by going back through all the documentation or by sending to some claim consultant five terabytes of data to spend hundreds of thousands of dollars going through. Get the, you need the project team to, to guide you and to provide firsthand um, explanations and color commentary. And th they've got to be motivated to overcome that negative, the negative motivation of not, not providing notice and more specifically not prosecuting claims. I may sound a little cynical, I am, but I think I'm also, um, it's born of experience. If someone says, back up a second, I realize that you're gonna sort of nip and tuck and cut deals all the time on the project, that's just good business. Um, but when you have serious issues, you have got to preserve your rights. And what I always say, if somebody says, oh, if you file that $5 million claim against us, oh, well, that's gonna be the end of the relationship. Well, let me tell you, if somebody threatens you like that, 
They're going to screw you anyway. So it, send in the notice and prepare the claim. Don't call them names. Don't send a nasty gram. Just as Chad said, the facts, facts, facts. Oh, and the other thing to help motivate the project team, if they just want to kick it back to in-house counsel or outside counsel, or like, why can't you bring a claim consultant in here? Remind them that it's not going away. You know, if this thing goes to litigation, guess what? You're not going on to your next big project. You're going to be working, you know, we're going to tell management we need you to work on this. And it's, it's going to be worth, I mean, it's, it's much better than anything attorneys or consultants can do. They can do more with the help of the project team. And it's pretty easy to convince. In fact, it's like rolling off a log to convince management, like, you give me these people's time, we'll have a better product that's more accurate and much cheaper. We're going to get them. And surprise, I, I know this comes as a shock. Most people in construction really don't want to hang out with lawyers and reliving some horrific project that they just finished. So what I'm going to talk about today, again, it is the, uh, it's beyond just project documentation. We're talking about a real live dispute, change order claim, whatever you want to call it. Uh, I'm going to talk about direct presentation and negotiation related to a little bit what Daniel Murdoch said, some more formal um, on-site intervention that's non-binding with third parties, and I'm going to end, oh, I'm going to talk about DRB's mediation, and then I'm going to end with arbitration. Not along the lines that William and Rich talked about, but some tactical procedural things that will help arbitration stay ADR because there is a major risk um, in, in circumstances and historically of it being, what is it, as bad as litigation, it just costs more and takes longer if it's not done properly. Uh, quick thing before I move on to the broader thing, and I don't think we've talked about this, but emphasize it, everybody knows this, but it deserves mentioning and reinforcement. Damages are critically important. All the lawyers remember, um, well, maybe I'm remembering when I started at my first firm and did started doing construction law or contracts class. It's like liability is great and glamorous and, oh, isn't this exciting? But if, if you don't have damages and if you can't prove your damages, liability doesn't mean anything. So... And again, all construction is dollars and cents. And if anybody, it's like when clients are like, well, I'm the principal thing. I'm like, whoa, whoa. If you want to pursue something on principal, I know that's going to go badly for me. Because if your principal is proven and you spent a lot of money, it's going to be like, well, what the heck did we do that for? Just to prove a point? And then worse, if they want to, you know, go forward on principal, even if they're at risk and it breaks bad, I'm pretty sure they're gonna forget that they, it was over my objections that they pursued it on principle and I'll get blamed again. Um, a couple things, and a lot of this is common sense, but people forget it all the time, especially on the project when people are having to push things out the door because they're very busy and then they're, they're, they have more than a full-time job with a regular project responsibilities and the can sort of gets kicked down the road on damages and a lot of other things. So I'm talking about doing stuff now, uh, early on, and I know it's got to be incremental and, and limited in certain circumstances depending on where you are in the process or the project. So a couple caveats or warnings. I'm totally fine with seeking the highest reasonable value on a claim as long as you put proper caveats in there in terms of doing anything that may could be characterized as a misrepresentation or overstatement. Obviously, you don't want to talk about trade bait or negotiation buffer uh, because if you're on a federal project and the government doesn't like you, that's a False Claims Act investigation right there, civil. Whether or not it goes any place or not doesn't matter, but I could assure you once the uh, switch flips on a, even a civil false claims uh, investigation, you got a major problem because it's going to be a distraction. It's potentially going to be 
costly, and then what the, sometimes the government will do, a legitimate thing, is all of a sudden what was a negotiating strategy for you where you had a buffer in there or some tr you know, negotiation bait, trade bait, that's a false claim to them. And actually, technically, in a lot of instances, it can be. Another thing I emphasize, and this especially relates to the can getting kicked down the road when somebody puts together some preliminary pricing, just be transparent with forward pricing and estimating or the selling price. Because it's crazy, but sometimes, you know, the project puts together, because a lot of times the event is not over on big projects. It's going to go on for a while, and they forward price it, and then they never update it. Like literally, I've had in the last year, it happened again. We're years later, we're getting ready to go into arbitration, we have the claim amount, and it's like, wait a minute, you're t calling these costs, number one, they're not costs, they were forward priced estimates that you did six months before the work took place or six months before the work finished. Have you gone back and looked at what your actual costs are? Now, sometimes it's appropriate to use contract rates and selling price and all that other stuff. But two things, you need to recognize that's hard to get, number one. And then what you really don't want to do is characterize selling price and forward estimates as costs. And it happens all the time. And I'll be like, stop. Those are not costs. When you say costs, it sounds like you spent that money. And either you don't know you spent that money, and it may be that you didn't spend that money because typically you know, you're sort of going to overprice when you're forward pricing because of the risk of the unknown. And you're really ideally wanting to negotiate a lump sum, and it doesn't matter. Well, if you don't negotiate the lump sum and you never update and pay attention to the cost, you're potentially going to have a problem. The other thing, and this is about preparing the claim, not affirmatively preparing the claim and, and a, I hate to call it an offensive step, but in terms of prosecuting the claim, especially in public contracts, federal, state and local, and see them at risk, where you basically have an open book situation. When you're pricing claims, think in terms of an audit at the end, because you're surely going to be subject to an audit if they want to exercise it in any public contract. Uh, see them at risk contract or, or a um, progressive design build with a GMP, they're all going to have audit provisions. And they're going to be able to audit you. So what I was raised to do and always do is price the claim off your books. Now, again, there may be a circumstance if you had stipulated rates you know, for manpower, equipment, or stuff like that. But, and I'm not, you can't do this when you're forward pricing, but price it off your records and basically don't worry about an audit, but pr price it and put your package together like a prepackaged audit. So you can say, come in and audit me. Like, look at this. Here it's easy. Turn the page, there's a cross reference, there's that invoice, here's the calculation, this is what we did. Um, because ideally, that's what you may have to do later on, and it's easier to do it sooner rather than later. Um, and, and instead of being afraid of an audit, you say, come in and audit me. I want you to audit me, because we may fight over whether it's a defective spec or a different site condition or whatever, but I don't want to fight about, I don't want there to be any doubt that we spent this money. The only thing in doubt is the causation, which presumably we think we're in good shape. Um, you know, ideally, it's better to uh, have a cost-based pricing from the beginning, but a lot of times that's just impossible or impractical um, because it's not an instantaneous thing that happened and it's over. It's usually going to be an impact that carries on for a while. But then, like I said, don't get two years later think you have a $3 million claim because that's how it was forward priced two years ago and no one's looked to see if you spent, generally if you, they spent more, they're going to look at that, but if they in fact spent less and recovery is a cost basis, um, that's problematic from a credibility standpoint. Um, 
you know, the other thing, uh, and I, I got to mention this because it's happened so many times when it's like inefficiency. Everybody knows if you either defended or prosecuted an inefficiency claim, they are hard as heck to prove up with certainty. If someone does like, and I don't care, you know, if you have a great measured mile, great. I've been doing this 40 years. I've never seen a perfect measured mile. It's always like, well, we didn't have a good measured mile, so we had to make up this one and do this and take it from other things. So that looks specific, but that's problematic because you can challenge it like, no, that wasn't a proper measured mile. You did not follow the thing. You took it from another project. You took some unrealistic slice uh, of this project when you were doing um, you know, you were doing shop fabrication and, you know, you're counting that again when you were hanging steel and installing miscellaneous steel and everything else. And, you know, that's very different uh, efficiency levels. And the other thing is when on inefficiency, when they decide to put in a lost productivity cost code on the job in the job accounting, I have never seen that where it's like, oh, yeah, we did that code. Great. How much money is in there? $5,000, what's our claim? $5 million, I'm like, great. And that, it's totally understandable because the people in the field don't know, like, am I being inefficient? Like, if it's like you gotta build this separate building, that's easy. If it's inefficiency related to uh, work in the, you know, the original scope of work, that's gonna be tough to cost code. You gotta have other records. You gotta maintain your cost coding and tracking but it's gonna be daily reports, three week look ahead schedules, meeting minutes, other things. Last thing about total cost. What's total cost? A total cost claim is when you say, my contract price is a million dollars, it costs $1.5 million, I want $500,000. That is a total cost claim. If you go into your mechanical, you just say, for example, you're, you're a general contractor or an EPC contractor. You go into mechanical and you go, uh, you basically do the same thing. Don't ever, ever, ever call your claim a total cost claim unless you did what I said, which was we spent 1.5 million, it's a million dollar project. Never do that. It's stupid to do it. You just, you might as well just put, you know, donkey ears on or something. <laughs> Um, on the other hand, you want to take every opportunity to call the claim you're defending a total cost claim. And just the same thing, pin the tail on that donkey. I'm not saying to totally lie, but you will find a lot of claims are total cost claims. Like when I love when they, you know, the, the sub may break it up and be like, okay, uh, in, in this scope, it was this much. We had this much extra. In this scope, we had this much extra. We had this scope, we had this much. And they add it all up. And I'm like, that's a total cost claim. You just did it in pieces. Or my other favorite, which I have to admit, um, sometimes it may be appropriate, where they load all the overruns into the claim, but any underruns where they did better, it's like, whoa, no, those are for our benefit. You can't have that. Um, Okay, the next thing about direct presentation and negotiation, I mean, again, what I wanna emphasize, I'm not saying, oh, you gotta get an outside lawyer. You have to have a claim consultant. As soon, you gotta bring a mediator in as soon as possible. Absolutely not. But what, as Daniel referred to, and I was gonna comment on Daniel's excellent insight and training, because he worked with, it, with us in his youth. Um, but th that direct, <laughs> I said his youth, not mine. Um, is, is the thing about like people write letters, they're like, well, we sent them a 20 page letter with 50 attachments and everything else. So one, whether it's a phone call or a meeting or whatever, that is very important. Anybody thinks, thinks that just writing a long, detailed, technical letter is the end of the process, like figure it out, you're crazy. You just haven't been out in the real world to understand the need to explain and present and humanize it. And I'll talk a little bit about more about the humanization in a minute. Um, 
So what you want to do all along, in my opinion, from the beginning, and again, we're not just writing notice letters and things like that. Now we've got a claim or dispute of some magnitude um, is you want to take the you want to make the appropriate level of present a preparation of that claim at that point. So again, that doesn't mean you have to go, oh, we have to have the scheduling consultant come in and do a hundred thousand dollar report and render an opinion about where the critical path is. No, I just mean the project people firsthand when the facts are straight, don't write cryptic letter and cross references, write what I always call an idiot proof letter. And I always say, I'm the idiot. Like, if, if I don't understand it when you explain it to me, that's your problem. That's not my problem. Because the, the, exe the person on the other side or their senior management, um, they may know more, know more than me. You gotta write it for them. And what about later on, and this is the uh, begin with the end in mind, I said resolution. Well, I'm also thinking about going to trial. And, and if, if you just have a bunch of, you, know, you don't have stuff where you're explaining it in detail. There may be some posturing in there and demonstrating how you're good at it, but it's just explaining exactly in simple terms, technical terms when it's appropriate, what the problem is. And once again, I would say, that's not just putting that in the email or on Procore or whatever. Try to have face-to-face -face meetings to present it. Um, Another fundamental thing that I found, and this again goes back to my upbringing as a construction lawyer, like what is, and I know it may vary under special circumstances, but how I was raised and um, how I still pursue it is I don't, is not to hide your hand. I mean, if you want to hide your hand, you don't have to confess to some incompetence or hiccup, but if you don't want to be like, well, no, I'm not going to explain everything to them now, and I'm surely not showing their damages, well, guess what? You're not going to get paid, and you're going to have to show that in arbitration or litigation later on, so why not put it together now and present it? Again, damages and everything else, but some people, I mean, it's just negotiation tactics in construction. Again, there's exceptions. I think it's bad about like whether you're going to hold everything close to your, your chest or if you are going to, I, I call it selling a house because of the example that my mentor over at Curry gave me. I heard him tell clients, he's like, look, think of your claim. You had a million dollar claims. That's like selling a house. Okay, no, seriously. You're trying to convince them there is this thing of value, i.e. we're going to get it from you later pay me now, we'll discount it, we'll save relationship, attorney's fees, all that other stuff. Are you gonna stand on the front porch of the house and go, give me a million dollars for this house, it's a great house. And they say, well, can I come in and look around? No, no, you can't look at it, just give me a million dollars. It's like, no. So I, I can't remember if it survived the slide, um, if my revisions, but I'm like, get there, it's the expression, get there the firstest with the mostest, it's supposedly a military term, not proper English, I might add. So get out in front with the explanation, accumulating your documentation, your damages, and uh, explaining it. Uh, ba, 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 ba. Okay, so that's the hiding your hand versus selling your house. I'm a true believer, it's how I was raised of, of like you're selling a house. Again, you don't have to, as Overton would say, get naked and jump in the pool of truth of, of bad things, but you want to, the good stuff, the convincing stuff, you want to get out there. And also in terms of whether it's mediation we'll, that we'll talk about or just negotiation, you know, I am mindful of the fact that it takes two to tango. Like you can't settle if the other side won't talk to you. And then sometimes there may be some legitimacy of, withholding information for a little longer, or if you really think they're gonna get a tactical advantage, but if you think you have a great claim, or if you ha think you have a great defense, well, why are you shy about showing it to the other side? I mean, actually, if you're making the crap up, then you probably don't wanna do that, but if you have good entitlement, um, or at least can present it as good entitlement and good costs, get it to them sooner rather than um, later. 
And again, sometimes it may be appropriate if they're not negotiating, like I'll talk about mediation. If you think it's gonna be a waste of time, don't mediate with the other side. You may have cooked off your one opportunity, but otherwise there's no reason to say to them, hey, you don't use these words, we're gonna kick your butt and this is how. Um, so that, that that may inspire them to negotiate in good faith. And I always tell lawyers all the time that on the other side where they're like hiding the ball, I'm like, look, if, you can, if you're gonna kick my butt, could you tell me now so I could avoid the humiliation and I could reassess the, uh, my assessment of the case? But that's just how somebody does it. Um, you know, as I said, when we're working during the project, I, I'm still thinking this way, is, is I'm always thinking of trial. And again, not to get there, but to avoid it. So it's like every document is a potential exhibit, including, as Chad said, you know, our favorite thing to do is write our own trial exhibits. It's like, this is awesome. Um, at, we, at the cocktail party, we could, Bill Shaughnessy can tell you a war story about uh, the letter he and I drafted that was the centerpiece of a wrongful termination claim. And I'm like, oh my God, this is great. Best afternoon we ever spent. Uh, and again, every project person I talk to is a potential witness. That's just how I, I mean, I look at them like, we can't put this person out in public or this person should be our celebrity spokesperson. And then the other thing I wanna emphasize is you don't need a mediator, you don't need an expert, you don't need a DRB, you don't need a lawyer to do presentations on the project site about important issues and claims. And I can't remember, it was William, whoever mentioned it, that's even more important when there's an opportunity to mitigate and get that out there. First of all, it's arguably an implied obligation, the, the, uh, the obligation to mitigate, it ties in with notice that somebody else talked about as well. But hey, yeah, we disagree. But like maybe it's a $2 million dispute, not a $10 million dispute because they, they agree to loosen some spec or change the uh, foundation drawings or something so the, um, the different site condition is not a big deal. Um, okay, now I'm just gonna talk about mediation. Some of it was touchy-feely. Uh, some of this front stuff has already been addressed, and that is the bugaboo. Are there time limits? You look at the AIA and most of the standard contracts. Actually, most contracts have time limits. It's like, if you want to do something, you could ask for mediation, whether it's optional or not. But then it says it has to be concluded. It's usually going to be a little longer than 30 days or whatever, but that's it. There's a timeline. And again, Bill Shaughnessy had, and I had a case up in the Pacific Northwest. It was one of those cases where the uh, design builder spent much more money than they thought, and we got as much money out as we could out of uh, the Washington DOT, so we went after our designer. And in that case, it was a, um, so it was a designer, really their E&O carrier, and they just said, no, the mediation's not over. Like, you can't, it's a condition precedent. You can't go forward. That was a bespoke contract. Um, and it's like, you told us to pound sand. Like, there's nothing to mediate. What are you talking about? It's over. And in that case, because there wasn't a specific deadline, we had to go under a Rule 7 arbitrator in the AAA, I think, and they rendered a decision like, yeah, no, this thing goes on. And we did it that way. Um, some basic, you know, important thing, I don't know why it's not on here, what's the timing of the mediation? So I'm a big proponent of mediation, but like what ticks me off and I find is incredibly wasteful is when it's like, no, no, no. I understand a lot of times you may have to do most of the document discovery. Ideally, it could be more limited so people have some information exchange and then can mediate. Can mediate. But because as they were talking about now with the ESI, I mean, it's just like in for a penny, in for a pat. I mean, it's just like, it's so hard to nip the document discovery in the bud unless you basically have none. But to me, it's a total waste most of the time. If you take, go through weeks or months of, our, of depositions, that's one of the most expensive things to do. I personally think depositions are abused, uh, either for profit or as a crutch for either the attorneys and or the parties that don't know their case. And my position is if you're a claimant 
you should be able to try a case without one document being produced and one deposition taken. If you're a claimant on a construction project, unless, of course, it's fraud or um, failure to disclose information and stuff like that. I mean, I've, I've, not lately, but I tried, we tried 101 day arbitration. We did not take one deposition and that was, well, no, we did some computer discovery. Um, didn't suffer from it at all. Um, but again, it's just frustrating to basically spend all that money and settle. Were all those depositions really necessary or could have been one or two or none? Um, it, it, but then the other thing, I'm always very hesitant to go do a mediation where it's like, well, they're telling us to drop dead. Uh, well, let's give it a try. Well, because my concern is if you have a mediation and it bombs, it's usually, and I mean bombs, I don't just mean it didn't settle, but the people are talking. It bombs, there's a high possibility that everyone is gonna get entrenched and, and or go back and say, that was a waste of time last time, why should we do it? So although I hate it when it's all the way after all the discovery costs, you can't do it too early because that may be your last opportunity. Dispute review boards. I am a big proponent of dispute review boards. Uh, when, just some key things. A dispute report, a dis DRB is not a DRB is not a DRB. It's just like design build does not describe all the rights of the, the parties. Read the DRB specs, read the contract terms, the specs, all the attachments, because it may not be what you're thinking about. There's a lot of variables. Um, one of the things, direct attorney participation, what is it, what's the thing? Of, I have the enthusiasm of a convert, whatever. The first DRB I was in in the late 80s, I was a Corps of Engineers on a project site. We could not talk at all. Like, I just had to sit there and I'd never been in anything like that. Uh, and I thought, this is the worst idea. Uh, you know, the DB, DRB Foundation's very adamant about it. I'm like, that's ridiculous to keep lawyers out when so much money is at risk, even if it's allegedly non-binding. Well. Fast forward 15 years, I think that's the only way to go uh, for several reasons. It does keep down the level of adversity, um, but the main thing is guess who's having a prep to make presentations and do all that? It's the project people. It's the people that are gonna be witnesses later on. And it's not just like, here attorney, or here claim consultant, look at this stuff and tell a good story. It's like, no, their behind's gonna be on the frying pan, and they've gotta get up there and speak to it. And they've gotta to respond to the DRB members. And they have to get up and give the rebuttal when the other side attacks them. So, um, and mostly the ones we're in now, we at least get to go and we're there, and it's obvious that we've, we've sort of written, produced, and directed all the presentations, but it's firsthand the people and I, project people, and I heavily endorse it. Uh, the impact of the DRB recommendation, you all just have to think about the practical consequences. DRB Foundation, a lot of the standard specs, it's a recommendation, but if it's admissible in court, you may want to think about the fact that is it legally binding? No, but especially if you're going to court, in a jury trial, and you say, hey, we're gonna need a month on the plaintiff, you know, it's like, oh, it's this big claim, we're gonna need a month jury trial to try all this stuff. And the defendant gets up, it's like, well, yes, your honor, it is very complicated and time consuming. I think it'll take more than a month. But fortunately, we have this recommendation by three industry experts that the parties mutually um, selected, and they agreed the claim was dog poop. Now, the, the judge can't throw it out, but I would not expect a rapid trial at that point. You know, the judge is just gonna push it off and pressure the people to, uh, to settle. Uh, blah, blah, blah. Um, okay, the main thing I wanna say about DRBs, one, don't wait for it, set it up immediately. If I'm getting called in because the project is on the rocks and I'm like, you got a DRB? Yes. Who are they? Oh, we haven't set it up yet. I'm like, well, this is gonna be a great time to try to agree on DRB members. Um, and the other thing I point out, if you're in a DRB hearing, whether or not the lawyers are talking, that's an adversarial process. 
you, that is not a mediation, that is not a negotiation. The DRB members are gonna decide in a recommendation, okay? Which can be very helpful, but um, that's what it is. The biggest value, or one of the largest values of DRB in my mind, is not for the formal hearing and the recommendation, it's having them involved in those regular meetings appropriate to the project once a month, once a quarter, whatever, where they kind of merge partnering and other things. So guess what? It's like uh, Daniel was talking about, the, the, the key project principles have to be in a room together and report to the DRB members. And I've seen and I believe that that is a more important function or it can be a more fun important function than the DRB sitting as you know judge at the end because through their comments, through a week and a nod, a nod, through just making the people talk about their problems at the same time, and especially when it comes to mitigation, that's a tremendous uh, value. And then the other thing, the reference to um, strategic use, um, again, that a big thing in Miami, I had fight over the CM risk over whether or not we had design responsibility. Well. There was already about $20 million worth of claims and the number was mounting. Instead of taking $20 million of claims or forward price tens of millions of dollars more, we picked like a $200,000 issue and presented on that. Go figure. We thought it was a good illustration of how we cannot be responsible for the design. We won that with the DRB and lo and behold, the owner, to their credit, it's not like they were weak, they were smart, they settled, we redid the whole contract and made it cost plus because they realized this was terrible, it was a huge problem, it was only gonna get worse, and they've had a neutral party tell them what the problem, tell them that we were right, respected people that they picked. Last thing, real quick, I just wanna talk about, again, is arbitration still ADR? Legitimate questions about that. Um, but the, I will give the AAA, the biggest provider in the U.S., credit. They have really strived to emphasize the expedited, the alternative part of it. And I don't know if, uh, if any of you have ever read the 2021 best practices from the AAA on discovery and good structure and arbitration. It's awesome. Rich Tyler was involved in that um, because it une like une unequivocally talks about no, 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 you, that's not what arbitration is about. The arbitrator shouldn't do this, they shouldn't give a lot of discovery, blah, blah, blah. The rules say that too. The rules say, by default, no depositions. That's what the rules say. People forget about that. But, so this is just to illustrate how I do think arbitration can be still uh, ADR. Um, and I'm just gonna illustrate that with what I do all the time. And frankly, it doesn't matter if I'm a plaintiff or defendant because Chad and I and Rich, we were raised as claim, like prosecuting claims. So even now we do a lot more defensive stuff, it seems. But even on that, we don't, play, you know, we don't go insurance defense four corners. We go out and attack the claim, like search and destroy, like kill it soon rather than, you know, going through years of uh, litigation or arbitration and things like that. And that's consistent with what I say in arbitration. And what I do before we pick the arbitrators, before we've had an administrative conference, I call the other side and I send them basically the same email that I tweak because I'm staking out a position. I know I'll have to back off from it. I would live with it most of the time if I had to, but I, I, an adamant thing, I don't care if I'm a plaintiff or defendant, I'm like, we don't need that much time. We don't need that much discovery. Set a hearing, set a hearing, set a hearing, have an end date. Have the hearing be continuous, contiguous weeks to a certain extent, say we can do it, don't be irresponsible. But the other side, I don't even care if they're claimants. Most opposing counsel and certainly the defendants is like, oh no, we cannot possibly do that in less than four weeks. Baloney, they've never tried cases under a chess clock. Um, so I say early hearing date, limited targeted discovery, you have to have like, and we have the ESI protocol standard canned and have draft uh, 
search terms already. I don't do any of that stuff, but other people do. I say no depositions except for experts, but I know we're probably going to have to yield ground. But I hold on as much as I can, and we'll say 10 hours, 20 hours, 30 hours, whatever, and you could either take full or half-day depositions. So even if you only have five days of deposition, you can take 10 depositions if you have that much time. I want to resolve evidentiary issues early. So to get it straight, like one of my big things is, are we going to go through the rigmarole of authenticating documents? Or is it good enough it's got a Bates number and it's self-identifying? Just because I like to be prepared with formal, like, I don't want to like go into vapor lock if somebody objects for lack of foundation. <laughs> like, I'll be like, oh God. I always keep the post-it anyway on my desk about how to lay the foundation for a document to get it admitted. But I want all that cleaned up at the beginning so you're not two weeks before hearing fighting about that. And part of it, and this sounds cynical on my part, maybe it is, I go to people, I mean, that's why I talk to the opposing counsel early and not like I'm gonna kick your butt. It's like, hey, let's talk about how we can do this. And because everything I'm saying is common sense and it's good and it seems like it's hip, especially the Chescott, they're more likely to agree then because they're like, oh, okay. And they don't wanna think like they're, uh, they don't wanna appear like they're in the Anderthal. The other thing, Rich talked about a chess clock. As far as I'm concerned, if you're a construction lawyer and you can't handle and you don't want a chess clock, you don't know what you're doing unless you, unless you are playing a rope a dope defensive things. I mean, first chess clock I did was federal court. Every lawyer will say, and it was insane how little time we had for this very large and multi-part complex dispute. All the lawyers would say they were never so prepared before. Every chess clock mediation I've done, we've almost always finished a half day early, except for um, one that uh, Bill Shaughnessy did where the, the opposing counsel clearly was not prepared and had to keep asking for another half of day. I come out saying no transcript. Now I realize if you're gonna have six weeks of hearing over 10 months, well, you better have a transcript. But guess what? You wanna jack up the cost of post-trial hearing? Have a transcript. If you don't have a transcript, you run the risk of the other side making stuff up. But I guarantee you, the cost of the post-hearing briefing will be a fraction. And I have to admit, I generally end up, we end up often having it. And the other thing is, I ask for a general award. It's like. This party gets X money, period. Why? Because that's the hardest thing to challenge. But again, that freaks most people out. And also because you have, uh, if you have subclaims and things like that, you may want to have special allocations there. Okay, I'm going to stop there. I have so many more tidbits of wisdom. But uh, anyway, thank you very much. I didn't save that much time. <laughs>